been asking this question, question since March. What difference does the cross make? What difference does the resurrection make? And since Easter, we've been talking about this way that we can have into new life. You no longer have to live under the bondage of sin, any sin. And so I want you to take your Bibles, if you would, with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And we're going to begin with the first verse. Here's what Paul says. So what should we say then? Should we continue to sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life. For if we have been joined with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that sin's dominion over the body may be abolished so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin since a person who has died is freed from sin's claims. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him because We know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. For in the light of the fact that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But in light of the fact that he lives, he lives to God. So You too consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. And do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness. But as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you because you are not under law, but under grace. Now, I I can tell you right now that this passage has a whole lot more than we can deal with in the time that I have. It is a rich theological section of Scripture We could spend probably a message on almost every verse of this passage. But I do want us to see some things that I think are very important. And there are three things in particular that I think should garner our attention. The first is this. The resurrection is our promise of a new way of life. The resurrection is our promise of a new way of life. When you want to know why the resurrection of Jesus is such a big deal, why Easter reigns on our ecclesiastical calendar, it's because it is the very essence of why we have a new life available to us. God's grace and therefore his forgiveness is not an excuse to sin. <coughs> Likely, There were some people in the Roman church that were saying, okay, now think with me on this. If I get God's grace because I've sinned, why not sin more to get more of God's grace? Huh? Huh? What do you think? And Paul Paul goes, no. Absolutely not. You don't want to have more sin just because God 
And that presumes upon God. Now, I know as Baptists, we get, we get slammed at times by those who believe that they can lose their salvation. We believe that all genuine believers endure to the end. It's often referred to as once saved, always saved. That's, that's one of our foundational beliefs. And so I've had people say to me, well, if I believed the way you did, I'd just go out and do all the sin that I want to because I'm not going to lose my salvation. My response is always, if you want to go out and commit all the sin you want to, you don't have a salvation. You can't lose that which you do not possess. So Paul, by the way, this phrase, absolutely not, may it never be. He uses it 14 times, 10 of them in the book of Romans alone. So it's a, it's a, a device that he's using where he, he throws out something that the opposition's been saying and then he comes back and goes, no, that's not what God means. And he's trying to get them to understand that we don't have more sin so that we can have more grace. If we have died to sin, then he's asking this question, why do we live in it? If we have died to sin, why do we live in it? Now, when we talk about this, we're not talking about an occasional sin. All of us wrestle, wrestle with occasional sin. It's all under the blood of Jesus, but we still wrestle with it. What he is referring to is when sin is our characteristic. When there is no difference between the sin and us. So in spite of our past, Paul is saying we can overcome sin because we've been crucified with Christ. He says in verse 5, For if we have been joined with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly be in the likeness of his resurrection. So when we have been crucified with Christ, now we have a new identity. We're no longer the same. We have been radically changed. We're altered now, Paul would say it this way to the Corinthians in his first letter in chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Here's what he says. Don't you know that unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God or God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral person, idolaters, adulterers, or anyone practicing homosexuality, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be like this. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Now, Paul's intention was not to give us an exhaustive list of every sin. So don't go, mine is not listed. Woo! Man, thank you, Jesus. No, he's not saying that. He's saying, look, if your life is characterized by sin, Let me give you an example, besides some of the obvious ones. Let's say you come to me and say, Pastor, I just need to let you know, um, I make a living by embezzling from my company. And by the way, I'm very good at it. I mean, I, I draw down about 200 k a year, and don't forget, I'm a tither, so you're going to get a cut. 20 k coming to the church. That is different than, oh, man, I have a church pen. I take pens home from the church all the time. But I'm not stealing. I'm just not paying attention. That's, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's different if you do something and it causes you to sin than if you wake up every morning and you're looking at that mirror as you're getting dressed and say, how do I not get caught today? You've now got an identity as a swindler, an identity as a fraud. That's what we're talking about by living in sin. It's now your identity. 
When Christ comes into your heart, he changes your identity, and the old man is completely dispensed of. It's completely annihilated. We are crucified with our old nature. Let's look what Paul says. And by the way, before we get to this next section, listen to this. There are times that it appears that we have two natures, our old nature and our new nature, and they're at war. You ever feel like that? Let's be honest. Yeah, we feel like that, don't we? We're at war. According to Scripture, not according to me, the old nature is dead, crucified. It does not exist as our nature. It exists as our temptation, but it does not exist as our nature. When we are in Christ, we are now a new creation. The old man is passed away and the new man here. I, I'd rather use creature, the old because I'm getting old. The old creature <laughs> is gone. It is encapsulated by the new creation we are in Christ. Now, because we have an old nature, guess who knows about it besides your wife? Satan. <laughs> Satan. No, I don't mean to equate that. I'm just saying <laughs> Satan knows your old nature. He knows what buttons to push. Can we be honest about temptation? If temptation weren't enticing, it wouldn't be temptation. I can promise you this. Not a single one of you this week were sitting at your desk or at home and said, I wonder if it would be fun for me to take this hammer and hit my thumb as hard as I can. Not one of you was tempted to do that. Why? Because it's not fun. Sin, sin represents something we already are pre disposed to do. Why? Because we were once sinners. And if sin wasn't enticing, it wouldn't be a temptation. It is not a temptation. I mean, it's not a sin to be tempted. We understand that. Jesus was tempted. Scripture says he was tempted in every way, yet without sin. So the sin is not being tempted. The sin is yielding to temptation. That's where sin shows up. And Martin Luther, I think, first said this. Billy Graham used to quote me and say it a lot. <laughs> and here's the deal. You can't keep birds from flying over your head, but you can prevent them from building a nest in your hair. You can't stop temptation. It's fleeting. It comes. It's there. We go, oh, oh man, I can't, I can't stay on that. When it becomes a sin is when you take that temptation, you grab it and you go, I'm going to think about that some more. I'm going to put that in our mind. I'm going to revisit that again. What's he saying secondly? I know the time. He's saying second, we're both dead and alive at the same time. Think about that. Remember those old Western posters? Wanted, dead or alive. Well, Satan's wanting you. He'll take you dead or alive. But we are, as followers of Jesus, both dead and alive at the same time. Look at verse 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that sin's dominion over the body would be abolished so that we will no longer be enslaved to sin. Look at verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. So when we die to our old nature, our old man, our old way of life, our old creature, we become alive in Christ. So we are crucified. Our sin is crucified. It's dead. And the resurrection says we are alive with the new life he promises. Here's what it means. 
It means we are dead to sin's power in your life. Satan cannot make you do anything. You need to hear that. He cannot make you do anything. He can tempt you to do everything. But he can't make you to do ever, anything because you died to sin. It no longer is reigning. It's no longer ruling in your life. Most of the sin we commit is out of our desire, not out of Satan's temptation. He doesn't have to bother with you for most sin. You're already pre-wired to sin. We have to live as if we're dead to sin. And we're dead to sin's power. It no longer has power in our lives. That's why he says we're no longer enslaved to sin. We need to start living that way. We are alive in Christ by the power of the resurrection. That's why it makes so much difference. That's why it's such a big deal. Because you've been given a new life in Christ and you no longer have to go back to that old way of living. Now, to make sure that that happened, God put you in a body of believers so there could be people walking with you and helping you overcome those tendencies, helping you to, to not yield to temptation. But God has a new life for you and you no longer have to live in that old way of living. So you are dead because you died to sin, but you're alive because Christ dwells in you and gives you strength to do what he's called you to do. There's a third thing that we need to see, and that is, since we have this new life in Christ, sin no longer rules our life. We need to stand up and shout hallelujah on this. Therefore, he says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so you obey its desires. It's that simple. All of that has been put away. All of that has been buried. The cross covered it all. When Jesus said in those last words on the cross, it is finished. It's not talking about his life. He's talking about the redemptive work to provide everything you need to have a relationship with God. And he said, it's finished. I'm bringing it to you. Everything you need. And so while we still have to deal with temptation... Sin no longer has dominion over us. That's the critical point here. We have a propensity towards sin. You have it. I have it. And I'm fooling myself if I think I could ever be above it because I'm not and neither are you. But it does not have to rule because I can choose the weapon that I use. We choose the weapon that we use. Notice what he says. Do not offer any parts of it, your body, this mortal body, this flesh. Do not offer any of it as weapons for unrighteousness. Don't give in to temptation. That's what he's saying. Don't allow yourself to be used for sin. Where that, you know, I have people all the time tell me, well, well, yeah, I got angry, but I can't help it. That's just the way I was raised. I'm a racist, but I can't help it. That's just the way I was raised. Oh, I, I, I think there ought to be injustice, but I can't help it. There ought to be justice, but I, that's the way I was raised. There's a Greek word for that. It's called baloney. <laughs> baloney. There's no excuse. You can't hide. My, what are you going to tell God? Well, you know, God, that's the way I was raised. And he goes, yeah, and I sent you salvation so you didn't have to stay there. We can choose which weapon. He says, but as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God, all the parts of yourself as weapons of righteousness. Just as we can be used for weapons of unrighteousness by yielding to temptation, we can be used as a weapon for righteousness by accepting God's grace and let it flow in our lives and accept the new way of life he has for us. You are a new creation in 
Christ Jesus. Not because of your ability, not because of your capability, but because of the power of God. We can live this new life with victory. You can overcome whatever it is you wrestle with. You can overcome whatever sin that you have have allowed to reign and rule and enslave you. You can overcome that all because of what Jesus did on the cross. His blood covers it all. And his resurrection brings to us a new way of living. So what is our next step? What do we do from here? Well, let me suggest that we break free from the bondage of sin by choosing the new life that Christ offers. He wants to give us this new life. The Bible says that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means you, it means me, it means your grandma. It also reveals that the wages of sin is death, separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. He wants to provide a way for you to overcome that sinful life you're headed toward. And so he sent his only son. And if we're willing to confess our sins, if we confess our sins, the Bible says, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Did you know you could be cleansed right now, here today, and you can begin this new life that he has for each one of us. In just a moment, I'm going to invite our worship team to come back and lead us in a time of commitment. But before we do that, I want to pray with you. And I'm going to be down here at the front. We'll have some others that will be standing here in the wings. We would love to pray with you step by step of how you could have a relationship with God. You can walk out of here knowing that you'd, if you died right now, you'd spend eternity in heaven. You can know that all because of the redemptive work of Jesus. So let's stand as we pray together. Father, I thank you for this moment. And I realize, Father, that there are those in the balance right now. They're deciding whether or not you're worthy of a commitment of a lifetime. Father, I pray that all of the rhetoric will be stripped away and it'll just be you and them in a conversation that will spring eternal. I thank you for the changed lives that are about to happen in Jesus' name.